Brothers, I, I want to say at the outset, it, it was Mike and I's original intention when we talked previously to record, and uh, I failed to do that um, for whatever reason it didn't work. Uh, this time, I, I believe it is going to work. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, attempting to record a call as well through the um, conference call service. I haven't tried to record a call before. I don't even think that it wouldn't work, but... And, um, and when I so. called in, it, it said as much. It said recording now. Okay. And, um, yeah, just for purpose of full disclosure, um, I'm on speakerphone, and uh, I'm using uh, my little digital recorder as well. So between the three of us, there ought to be at least one recording that works. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on speakerphone. I have no recording because I'm not that bright. <laughs> Well, so Mike and I talked previously, and uh, we, we kind of cut short because he had a, a hard appointment, and in fact, they arrived before we were done conversing even, so it, it kind of seems that uh, that we ought to bring you up to where we were in that conversation. Does, does that sound good, Mike? It's fine with me, yeah. I, I'm, I'm here. I am. Yep, I'm going to respond to Bobby, you, Tony, whoever. I'm not. I, yeah, that's fine with me. It's perfectly fine with me if that's where we want to start. Okay, well, thank you, brother. Um, and, and so, just to, where I'm at in this, you know, I'm, I'm addressing these issues, my, my interest in this uh, foremost, and certainly initially, was, was as Tony's friend and brother, and he is my dear, dear friend, and uh, closer than uh, most men on the planet. Uh, he certainly is, is in uh, a handful of men that I, I consider to be uh, very close and dear friends, and he knows that. And uh, Yes, I do. I believe it. And I, I believe you do. Um, and, uh, and I know he's my friend and, and dear brother. And, and we've got much evidence on both sides uh, for many years to show that. Um, I'm also addressing these issues as a, as a member of Tony's Cross Encounters Advisory Board. Um, at this point, I don't know. Maybe I'm a former member of his <laughs> Cross Encounters Advisory Board. I, I don't know. Um, not, not by my choice. Um, uh, and uh, I, I just, I'm not clear as uh, with, with with Tony coming beneath uh, Mike and the ministry there, uh, some of the statements, I, I'm not sure if there is an advisory board any longer, but that, that's my initial um, motivation. Uh, secondary okay, but, um, Pastor Jack, let me, uh, let me just bring clarification to that real quick. Okay. Uh, there have been no changes made in the advisory board. The advisory board is still uh, intact okay. and will remain so until such time as Cross Encounters Ministries becomes uh, an official ministry of a local church. Okay, very good. Thank you, Doug. Um, and then third, uh, I'm addressing these issues as a pastor uh, for the protection of the sheep of the Lord's fold in Beaverton um, and uh, more broadly, even in Davenport and at large. Um, so that's, that's my interest. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I have uh, that's my horse in the race. Um, it, it ultimately, for Christ, for his church, um, for my brother Tony, um, and, and yes, for, for Mike Reed and, and, uh, and the church there. And so, to update um, on what Tony and Bobby missed, uh, at the conclusion of our last conversation, the conversation between Mike and I, oh, almost two weeks ago, I think now, we have established, and Mike, you can clarify on any of these, of course, but we had established that, that you meet alone with the married women, the single women, and one teenage girl, there being two teenage girls in the church, one teenage girl for regularly scheduled private counsel and instruction. Does that sound accurate? Um, well, let me just clarify it. To make sure, I think you're saying this, but not every woman in the church. So I want to make sure that we know that 
I didn't say every, you didn't say not every. So we, but actually that we meet with married women, unmarried women, and one teenage woman, uh, that is accurate, but not everyone. Right. Right. Um, okay. would it be accurate to say, would it, would it be accurate to say that this is your shepherding methodology for the women of the church? Well, sure, uh, it is a shepherding methodology for all members of our church. Right, and, and my so, particular interest and concern is, is with the women. Um, I understand that, right. I, I, but I want to make sure that it's clear yes. that our methodology is no different for either gender. And, and yes, we don't meet with all men either. So, when right. you see methodology, you have meeting, uh, and I guess regularly, Mm, that's not our methodology because that's not that's not what happens with every member of the church. So it's part of our methodology, I guess, is how I would answer that. Well, to some level, they're, they're I mean, you can give me a percentage, perhaps, but but is it a fair number of women of the church you're meeting with on some regular basis? Yes, yeah, so I don't know. Again, yes, I, my answer would okay. be yes. Okay. I would say. At this current time, uh, less than, I would say around half of the women of our church meet with myself or Elder Nick on a regular basis, whether that be weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. Uh, I would say about half of the women are probably right now, if I had to go look on the schedule. Let's, and actually, Chuck, that's not even, as you tell me, that's not even actually because of my heart surgery, I haven't been having any of my regular meetings. But I want to speak as if I weren't still, so that we have a, the right kind of discussion. Gotcha, gotcha. It, yeah. Precluding something, interrupting the normal methodology and, and so forth. Um, and then it, 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 it bears defining alone. Um, we, we discussed it. Um, alone, uh, as we discussed, means you, you sometimes meet with the door closed, you sometimes meet with the door open, sometimes meet with the door open and, and at times people walk by and, and sometimes the doors open and people are upstairs. Yeah, so again, uh, that would be accurate, uh, ex except for now we don't have the same facility, so it's not the same setup but that has been accurate in the past, yes. Okay. Um, may I ask a question? Uh, people, your name. Um, Only Pastor, uh, Pastor Mike, um, the, the mention of doors open, doors closed, was that at the church building or was that at the uh, the office in your house with the glass enclosure? Or both? Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's both. That would be both. Okay. The church building and or my house with the glass enclosure. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bobby, I guess maybe for your clarification, the church building, um, when, when Pastor Chef was mentioning the church building that we're in, uh, work we used to be in, my office was downstairs of a house that we had a family, a congregational family living in that house. They lived upstairs while the kitchen was downstairs, so I kind of had an office in their house is what that was. Gotcha. Okay. And, and then, uh, uh, again, rehashing where we've been, that you see... Real quick, real quick, uh, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, real the definition of alone that I think might be useful for this group in our last discussion, uh, the definition of alone that Chuck, Pastor Chuck used was, even if you're in a room full of 40 people, if you and a woman are having a discussion away from the group that no one else can hear, he would define that as alone. Uh, well, I would disagree with that definition, but that was part of our discussion. That, that was... One definition. I, I gave you a gamut of what alone could be, and on one sense that would be, that would be alone. But yeah. but alone with the door closed, or alone in the office with the door open, that that's, that's significantly more alone if you. But the point of, of saying that, as far as in the crowd, is that there still could be private communication and a sense of a sense of intimacy. But moving on from our conversation last time, it seems that you see no moral compromise or conflict between 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual immorality, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lust, 
Romans 13, for make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust, and your practice of meeting alone with the married women, single women, and one teenage girl to regularly schedule private pastoral counsel and instruction. Correct. We could, we could discuss that if, if it would be good for the group. The second Timothy verse we didn't, to my not, to my not, not to my recollection, speak to last time. The other two you brought up and we discussed briefly, um, and I see no conflict between those two passages, the outside two that you just mentioned, and the, and the practice. We can discuss those scriptures a bit later if you don't mind. I just want to rehash where we've been and then and then uh, move ahead if, if that's okay. 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 Uh, that me. And then uh, I just want to make sure everything in work yeah. where I agree or understand or yeah. Yeah. So we're on the same page. And then the next point um, that that you have uh, both written and and verbally defended your position that 100% of pastors who fall in adultery after meeting with ladies of their congregation alone are, quote, not pastors, not even believers. In my experience, my understanding, any situation I know of, I know of no pastors, pastor, and again, I could go further, but I'll go with the conversation we're having. I know of no pastor that I would call a believer that I would call a pastor or even a believer that has committed adultery and an adulterous relationship, I would stand by that. Okay. And okay. Hold on. I have a question here. Okay. So, the, all right. So, so, just because you're saying you don't know of any, the, the, the more clarification you need from me is, it, my question is, do you believe it's possible for a believer, pastor or not pastor, to do something like that. Bobby, can you... Yes, I, can, can you the, the next few points all go along with this point, and it will help Mike answer your question okay. more fully. Okay. okay. If, if I okay. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. I would, I'd like to hear the answer to Bobby's question the way it was worded. Okay. Okay, so, um, Bobby, I believe what you asked me was, do I think that a believer can, pastor or non-pastor, believer be an adulterer? Is that what you're asking? I can commit that act. Now, I'm not saying a serial thing. I'm saying could, could it happen to that? No. Yeah. So, not. Yeah. So I believe that First Corinthians six nine through eleven, and it just depends on what you mean by could that happen. Um, back to Romans that that Chuck mentioned before. Giving, make no provision for the flesh. That means to make no plans for your digits. In other words, make no plans for your sin. Uh, adultery would require a lot of planning and a lot of willful sin. So, uh, it would be, I would be hard pressed to acknowledge or, or believe in someone, to trust in someone being a believer that has committed adultery. I cannot say that cannot happen because I'm not God and I don't decide those things. But I cannot see how someone could give provisions of the flesh. Of, you know, if you want to use a drunkenness, you don't accidentally get drunk. You intentionally, willfully get drunk. Now, I suppose a believer could accidentally get drunk. I believe a believer could be ignorant possibly to either one of those, although it would be hard to believe they could be ignorant to this. The gas commands on that. So I can I can I can not make any statements as to disqualify all people in some category or qualify all people. Okay. So experientially, I don't know of any, and biblically, I don't. I I, I believe that I uh, my greed is capable of any sin, but in Christ. Brother, that will not happen. So I can miss the things that I have to give my digits to. What about lying? Well, lying is certainly not, it depends if it's an intentional or willful lie. In other words, if I wake up the morning to a lie, but certainly I, I lie regularly. I exaggerate often. I, I lie. So that, that is a different issue than one that we make provision for the flesh. 
or making provision for the flesh is making plans to satisfy the digits. Right. Okay. Do, you, do, you, do, you think, do you believe that that in a in a in a situation where a, a man and a woman were alone, that something like that could happen, like unplanned? Well, could could again hypothetically could a man, a Christian man, and a Christian woman be alone and fall into that sin of adultery? Again, experientially, I don't know of anybody that can put in that category. I can't disqualify everyone. I would have a hard time, at least with a lot of discussion, but I would have a hard time putting a stamp of approval on, on that of, of, in our local assembly. That's not the same as lying. It's not the same as anger. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make perfect I'm just... That's my question. Sure. I could give another example that maybe helps. If, if I drop a rock on my foot, a person drops a rock on my foot, a Christian does that, I can certainly see where they let out an excellent believer when they swear. Uh, now they will be repentant and they will be broken and they will seek God's mercy. Uh, that is far different than a believer planning to go to the bar because they've had a long evil come home and have a bottle of wine which they know leads to drunkenness. That's a far different. That's a, that's a local sin versus a, what I will call a reactionary sin. Is that clear? Am I making myself clear? Yeah. So, the ability for any human being to sin, any kind of sin, every human being has that ability. In Christ, we won't have, we won't make provision for our flesh. And, yeah. So, and Chuck would say that making provision for the flesh would be needing a loan, and I'm saying that's not my understanding of the scriptures, that's not the context. That's not making provision for the flesh because there's nothing sexually immoral inside of that. Well, and, and that, we'll get to that. I'd like to get us up to date, and then we can discuss more fully, if possible. All right. So, um, uh, in agreement with with your your position that 100 percent of pastors who fall in adultery are not pastors and not even believers, um, you went on when when I brought up King David as an example of a man after God's own heart who who uh, was alone with another man's wife and subsequently committed adultery, you, your immediate response was to say, quote, was David even saved? Which I find consistent. I appreciate your consistency, but I, I do find consistently alarming. But now I'm giving commentary. And, 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 and Chuck, I find it equally alarming that you would assert that you know when David was saved. Well, so okay. we don't need to reject it. And we can, and your statement, if your statement there that alarms you of me saying we don't know when David was saved, salvation with the Holy Spirit indwelling versus salvation with the Holy Spirit not indwelling versus the, the way salvation is post resurrection and the thing of the Holy Spirit makes that a different animal. So that is my contention. Well, David's entire life up to that point was a life of faith. Uh, a life described by the simple term a man after God's own heart and and then in his subsequent repentance from that tragic fall uh, he, he did take out the Holy Spirit from me and we could debate the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament but I, I'm not really interested in that uh, the, the, the point being is that you were consistent with your position that 100% yeah. and, and, Amen I yeah. completely understand what you're saying yeah. my concern Chuck is equal I realize I'm the one that we're having the discussion with for your desire, but, but it, it, is, it is interesting to me that we want to make provisions for adultery inside of the pastorate. No, that, I find no, that alarming. Actually, I don't. I want to make no provision. I want to exhort you to make no provision also. But let's, let's, no, 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 let's no, 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 no. I don't make provision for I mean make room for a pastor to have that kind of relationship and be a Christian. That's concerning to me. Well, let's, let me, I'm almost to the end of the list, and then we can begin to discuss more readily. I just don't want to, 
I, I want to be fully up to date, then we can move ahead. So the, the final tidbit in that same vein was you saying that your boast is in Christ. I, I make no boast in my greed, which I appreciate, but my boast is in Christ. I make no boast in my flesh, but my boast is in Christ. And and your boast, to be clear, is that, that you're not going to fall because Christ is not going to let you fall. And you, you build that off of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Fall in what manner? You mean adultery? Yes. Okay. Is, is that accurate? That my boast is in Christ, that I will not fall in adultery because of my boast in Christ. Yes, because that will not happen by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. That brings us up to date. So, well, there, to bring up to date our discussion, from my perspective, there is one other thing. I, I, I asked Pastor Chuck to consider Proverbs 18.13. In that he had not heard the matter before he judged the matter. He, he disagreed with me. I brought up that I believe he had been, he had been slanderous in his comments and his emails toward me. And I, I said the way that Brother Tony had received that would, would show that they were slanderous. Uh, Pastor Chuck's response to me was, no, he wasn't slanderous that Tony thought that because my practices were so abhorrent that it pointed to pedophilia or, or being some sort of a, a, a delinquent, and that's why they seem slanderous. Okay. He disagreed with that as well. So, so let me clarify. Well, yeah, those, are things I, those are things I brought to the call, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was up to speed on as well. Absolutely. Um, so let me clarify. Uh, okay. Proverbs, okay. Proverbs 18.13, uh, he who answers a matter before he hears it, that it's folly and a shame to him. One, I, I directly heard from you multiple times, and we can quibble over whether I heard your voice or whether I heard it in writing, or whether I heard some of it directly from your voice and some of it in writing. Um, but we were interacting. So are we going to are we going to are we going to catch are we going to catch up to speed, or are we going to defend our position? No, I, I mean, okay, I agree. Um, I mean, I, that was my response. I'm just wondering. Okay. So that was my response. So that's catching us up. really disagreement. That was my response when you said it. Um, uh, and then as far as the slander, uh, again, slander would, would, one, require ill will, and two, require inaccurate information, and both of which I, I reject out that. And then to clarify on the, I never mentioned pedophilia. You brought up that Tony had said that I've all but accused you of being a predator and because yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the email, I don't have the email, so I may have spoken a bad word there. Okay, yeah. I did forgive I, I, I never I'm brought that the email. Right um, and I didn't bring you up okay. the predator. You, you said Tony's assessment that I've all but called you a predator is indication that I have slandered you, and I said no. Uh, it's indication that I have explained your practices in the light of day. In the light of day, they look really bad. And I asked this question. I said, Mike, what would a predator do differently? And so that brings us up to date. All right. Can I, can I interject? Sure. Yeah, uh, Pastor Chuck, I believe um, my statement um, was, was accurate uh, regarding how I I felt when I wrote it that you were all but accusing Pastor Mike of being a predator, and it wasn't because of your exposure of what Pastor Mike uh, was doing, or is doing, or is assumed to be doing, but your caricature of what you believe he is doing, or assume he is doing. And it had nothing to do with you bringing actual sin to life. Mm -hmm. so, so what would be the car caricature? Well, I, I believe your rhetoric was, was rather inflammatory, and and it assumed facts not in into evidence. Okay. I, I didn't assume anything, and I would argue that it wasn't but, inflammatory, but it was accurate. Um, so, but it's like, when you, when you caution your brother from moving to this church or going to this church because of the practices, and not forbidding him, but all but forbidding him, I would call that inflammatory. 
Well, that, that would be your opinion, um, but that's not inflammatory speech. That's, that's not slander, that's not defamation, that's me saying based upon dangerous practices and a dangerous doctrinal defense of them, brothers, don't go there. Your shepherding practice is unheard of because it's dangerous and it directly defies the warnings and prohibitions of Scripture that every other pastor I know of readily ascribes to and submits to. So, so again, we, we're, I guess we're into that discussion now. I would, I would disagree that you say the practices readily go against. We discussed Acts 20:28. We discussed shepherding not being gender specific. We've had those discussions. You brought, I asked you the question what scripture. You gave me a couple of scriptures. I disagree with the rest of Jesus. They are not highly, you know, if we're talking about the meeting with women, if that's what we're talking about, then that issue, I can separate the other issues, but the other issues that raise the red flags, starting out with pacifism, the meeting with women came later, I would argue none of those are out of the ordinary to the extent that you're communicating them. Certainly not in church history, certainly not in, even in today's world, as you would go out and explore people that might think the same way or teach the same way. Mike, you're, okay, Mike, and, I, don't, I don't want to go off topic, but you brought up pacifism. You, you are an extreme pacifist, to the extreme that you condemn a man who owns a gun for the self-defense of his family is having premeditated murder with that gun ownership. That is extreme. So, brother, you, so, then, so brother, I would say you have an equally extreme position when you have stated that, that I, if I'm not willing to defend my family with the use of deadly force that I'm in for, I believe that's extreme as well. <laughs> and, and, and I know you disagree. I know you disagree, but I believe that's very extreme. I think that's binding my conscience. Well, I, I have not one time told anyone they can't own a gun. And, and I would agree. You can you own a gun. I, I, I can use a gun more than a gun. I, I okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Hold on for one second. We're, we're going to get off top. Well, well, I do want to address something here because Pastor Chuck, again, this is, this, these are not the main things, but Pastor Chuck, you just said that pastor might condemn any Christian man that owns a gun. Okay, so pastor might just respond to that right there. It's an untrue statement. But it's part of the slander that gets thrown my way that I don't have a pastor. I don't have a pastor trust that he's hurt me on these issues. I certainly don't condemn any man who owns a gun. To my knowledge, pastor trust owns a gun. Okay. I've never condemned him once. Okay, so pastor trust, this, 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 this is how I want you to respond now. Pastor Trump, you said Pastor might condemn any man, any Christian man does not own a gun, and and he says not true. Okay, so can are you able to sure. come down from that statement or not? Oh, m most certainly not, unless he's able to retract his his clear teaching um, statements like this. Quote: This is my creed. Uh, why do you own a gun? And he's talking to every Christian. He says, you have premeditated murder, unquote. And that's just well, so I would, so, so Chuck, I think that's out of context. And again, we can go listen to that. And that may be an exact quote. Here's okay. another one. I'll let you finish. Here's another one. I'll let, I'll let, 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 him, let him go ahead and respond, Pastor Chuck. I don't need to. Mike, my, my, how okay. could that possibly be out of context? I'm trying to explain that, but I would do it. I would do it. Yep. He's trying to respond. I'm unable to, so I'll oh. wait until I... Yeah, there's a pause. Sorry. I'm going to let... I'm, I'm trying to let you speak. I'm, I'm going to make sure you're finished. Well, and I'm sorry. I'm trying to let you speak, and then there's a pause, and I'm thinking you're trying to let me speak, and then I... <laughs> okay. So, to answer your question... Just like I would say, and let's say that I change to under, well, any Christian, why would you have whiskey in your home? I believe that's a fair question to ask a Christian. It doesn't mean you can't have whiskey in your home, but I think that you have to consider why you have whiskey in your home. So, so you explain why would you have it with having whiskey? Absolutely, I can't. <laughs> it is certainly equatable. 
Would you agree that there are some men that own guns with premeditation of doing harm and vengeance on their hearts? Are there some men that would have that? Oh, certainly. Certainly. And some Christian men? Some Christian men? I don't know. I hope not. Uh, possibly. Um, could, there, could there be some? But let, let me let me give you another quote, Mike. I, I want you to. So, you answer, so you're not willing to answer that question? No, I did. I, I, I said I said possible. Okay. Well, I didn't hear you. So possibly. So if that's true, would I not then want to ask that Christian man why would you want to own a gun? And I can not consider his heart on owning a gun. Should you not consider that? Mike, you're, you're, you're mitigating and, and nuancing because here's a, here's a broader... But I guess, the answer, I guess the, answer, the answer is yes or no. Should they? Say again? Should they what? I had a question in there. Should a Christian man consider his heart on owning a gun? Yes. Okay, so if I ask him, why do you own a gun? And then explore that with him. Okay, but that's not what you're doing. That's not why. In context, you, you were, I disagree. You were giving a monologue against um, self-defense and defense of family. No, no, okay, no, 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 hold on. That's not true. Hold no, on. Okay, no, the thing started just with the pictures. The thing started with the discussion Tony and I were having about pictures of pastors with their AK 47s on Facebook. And that's you said, And you said, why do you own a gun? You have premeditated murder. But let me go to another quote, because it's more expensive. This is you. When you start talking about, quote, when you start talking about guns for self-defense, you have no biblical backing. What does a Christian need a gun for? What are you going to do with a gun, Christian? Christian, what do you need a gun for? For some of that idolatry. I think it is. Christian, what do you need a gun for? You put yourself in a position to murder someone. I'm not going to own a gun premeditatively knowing that I might murder someone. I'll share that everything I just said. I asked a bunch of questions. Christian, why do you own a gun? You put yourself in a position, you might be premeditating murder. I'll stand by everything you just read. I agree with everything I just said. Right. And that's extreme pacifism. You, you, can, you can move on, okay. mitigate it. Yeah, and, it is and look, you know, we have, have members of our church, we have members of our church that own guns. To my knowledge, Brother Tony owns guns. You might have put them up for sale. I only put them all up for sale. Spread to me for some of sale. I believe he owns guns. Because Mike, you hit it. I, 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 mean, I, would, I would guess, I would, I would guess Bobby McCreary owns guns. Mike, uh, you have made it clear that if someone breaks into your home and they tell you they're there to murder your son, you said, um, I, I can't de defend my son's life by taking the man who's there to murder my son by his own express testimony by taking his life. Um, and Chuck, there's two things about that. One, that's not, you started out not what I said. If a man told me he was there to murder my son, that's not what's been talked about. Actually, that's... Now, that, to answer your question, that, to answer your question... No, no, that is what you talked about I, in another teaching. So you're, so once, so once again, it, it's fine. We can go listen to all those and you can see exactly what we said in full context. But what I want you to know is, what you're saying right now, in this moment, is if I stand by that, I am in sin. That's what you're saying? Yes, I am. I'm saying and you should love. You're my, my, you're and you are finding, brother, you, you, are, brother, you are finding, I'm binding brother, you are finding my conscience. Under the word of God. You should it love. It is not the word of God. You should love your neighbor. And this allows I heard your whole sermon. Your other neighbor. Brother, I heard your whole sermon. To Who's my neighbor? You should love the Who's my neighbor? neighbor who is not seeking to slaughter. Sir, I don't know. Again, if a man walks in and says, I'm here to kill your family. But, 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 it, what, 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 what here is to do? This, this is a serious doctrine. It's an infringement upon well, he, 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 He's trying to answer it. Uh, Let him listen, 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 gentlemen, I, I don't mean to be short. I, I, by the grace of God, I will continue to have patience. It is, it's really not of much use to have this discussion from my perspective. I have listened to, Chuck, I listened to your entire sermon two times that you preached, I think it was three Sundays ago.
Uh, listen, I believe that she, I believe that she executed three different passages of scripture in a way that I wouldn't agree with. I, I don't want to. Between you and your tradition. I don't want to continue with this direction yeah, to discuss pacifism. There is more serious matter at hand. But so that's where this all started. And it's obviously an issue for you that I may sin. No, no. If I issue. don't kill that intruder, no. No. Then that is okay. a secondary right. issue. You're going to, I'm, I'm going to, gentlemen, I'm going to sit and listen now. Bobby or uh, Tony, if you have something to ask you, please do. That is, I'm, I'm, I can't keep up. I'm getting interrupted. Oh. That is a secondary issue. I never found it. Okay, listen. We've gotten rabbit trails. We, we, I laid out where Mike and I had been in our previous conversation, and Mike has changed the subject, and we have not discussed. Okay, well, right. well, let's move on then. You're, 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 you're laying aside pacifism at this juncture. Yeah. So the main issue for you, Pastor Chuck, is go ahead. I, I'm happy to talk about pacifism on another on another day, uh, but the main issue is a disqualifying issue. The main issue is dangerous practice and dangerous doctrine. And, and Mike, I take no pleasure in bringing up your historic three and a half year adulterous affair, but Mike, when I've got a man who holds to a dangerous practice of meeting alone as a shepherding methodology, regular meetings alone with the women of the church, the married women, the single women, teenage, to have private counsel and instruction. Um, every biblical moral alarm is going off, and rightly so. When the same man it has very unusual, dangerous doctrine, where he uh, declares that his birth is Christ, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 tells him that he cannot fall in Christ to adultery. Um, then, then the alarm, Mike, that was already at a 10, now, now it's at a 10,000. Because I have a man who needs to be showing that he's repentant, biblically repentant of adultery. And instead what he's showing me is the exact opposite. And, and you can quibble over Romans 13, 14 and say, it doesn't apply. Oh yes, it applies. Make him know. It doesn't say make, make him know, as in more provision. It, it makes no provision. And what we need to do is look at the definition of repentance in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 11 and consider words like, like diligence, like clearing of yourselves, like indignation, which is a holy hatred, like fear, vehement desire, zeal, vindication, and all things you have proved yourself to be clear in this matter. And Mike, you, you, you fail the test of biblical repentance of adultery, and that you systematically meet with women alone. And Salmon, Dr. Chuck, Salmon, Dr. Chuck, do you now, Dr. Chuck, do you now accusing Pastor Mike of being a false convert? Apparently he is, and I need to be done, because I can't defend myself against these, 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 these lies. I mean, again, as the agent, man, Chuck, Chuck, man, Chuck, man, Chuck, man, Chuck, man, one time, Chuck, man, there's no part of there. See, that's more of your unrepentance of your pride pre-Christ. I don't believe it's unrepentance, but that's a parallel. You, you, you make these claims, you make these accusations. I sit under the authority of elders of this church. I sit under the authority of elders of this church, and I, I have a congregation that knows my life. And you sit in, in David and Oregon and say there's no repentance because I shepherd, because Elder Nick and I shepherd both genders of the flock. No. And you, you, do you, have, no you have made this. Okay, gentlemen, I can't keep being interrupted. Just, just let, him, let him talk for a minute, Pastor. Bobby, I don't have... Bobby, Go ahead. Bobby, I, don't, I really don't. I don't have anything to say. I, I, there is a last thing I'll say about that. Chuck, in that last diatribe, you said, I have reason for concern at 10,000, and rightly so. Rightly so, based on your view, you send out an email, you, send, you get this thing going with a number of people, 
Brother Tony of one that you know well and you love and you've known for a long time and you trust. And you ignore, they don't see it that way. But because you do, it's rightly so. Doesn't matter if there's agreement with the people you've brought into the mix. You are going to decide that. You are going to have authority up for our local assembly. That's very dangerous. It's accusatory. It is slanderous. It's dishonest. You, you sit and say, I am unrepentant of my adulterous relationship. That's not true. That's, but you say, you're going to judge that. My, the word because of God you have that authority. is explicit. No, the word of God, brother, brother, the word of God is explicit about many things. Yes. In my view, in my view, that you and I disagree. I believe the word of God is explicit when it says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicated, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor sinners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I believe that's explicit. And, and therefore you say you cannot fall in adultery. I say I will not inherit the kingdom of God if I'm an adulterer. I say that's what the Word of God says. Now you say, in our discussion last time, that has to do with those that are living in sin. But then you go just a few verses later to verse 15, 18, and not, that, now that's not people that are in sin. That's not those same people. Well, it would be the same people. You can't have it both ways. So if that 18 is written to those that are in sin, then that's not written to me. I don't have to three cents on rally because I'm not practicing those things. You claim our last call, that's written to people that are doing those things. Can I ask you a question, Mike? Is that still verse 18? Mike, if a man has repented of being a child last year, and yet he today is having a shepherding ministry alone with children, is, is that reflecting repentance? Pastor yeah. Shepherd, you say, if you, you Pastor Chuck, I don't know your past at all. But what you're saying is, based on your past, you know, I don't know if the no, Marines, I, you, would you... Would you answer my question? What, no, 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 I'm, I'm, trying to answer, I'm trying to answer your question. My answer is, yes, a pastor could be with children. Yes, if to answer your question. So a pastor with pedophilia in his bathroom, certainly, by the way, certainly, would be problematic. Certainly, I uh, would totally agree. And now, again, you can disqualify me from the past to be curb of my affairs. That may be what you're trying to do. But I will tell you that, that both things that are committed outside of Christ, I'm forgiven and I'm free from those. As are you. Amen. Whatever it's committed, whatever it's committed, I'm just, you might have been a fornicator before marriage, but I have no idea, Chuck. But if you were, you're not disqualified because you were a fornicator. You know it's on the same list. They're going to disqualify you. No one I say you should never be around a woman. Uh, actually, my, again, I wasn't going to go there, but much of the church through much of history and even currently today does believe that husband of one wife means husband of one, one wife. And certainly we have concerns about a man who also had adultery in his background. And certainly we have concerns about a man who also is meeting alone so, so with most of the women in the church and is defending it with doctrine that is dangerous then this is this is this discussion this discussion that we're having now Pastor Chuck is intimating that I'm not even qualified to be a pastor. Well no, he's intimating more than that. He's intimating you're not saved. There, there is that. you're I, not no, saved. No, I am not. I, I there is that possibility. What I what I'm saying is that biblical repentance but you haven't has, repented. Has, has he said he never repented of his adultery. I was not explicitly said that, no. What I'm saying is... Come on, Dr. Chuck, that is what you said. There are parameters of repentance. whether or not he ever repented of his adulterous affair prior to Christ. 
because he's meeting with women in his church. My that God. is what you said. My systematic shepherding of women alone to counsel them and instruct them privately is not in keeping with repentance as God defines it. Diligence. That is not, there is not a verse in Scripture, Pastor Chuck, that supports what you just said. No. Uh, how about, tell me, indignation. You hate it as God hates it. Fear. You fear it. And, and, so, and so it's sad, it's sad to me that you would judge that I don't have indignation over that sin. That I don't, that I haven't repented. That, that's alarming to me. Let's get back that's to my alarm. 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 We don't get to talk yeah. about it. You're, you're, again, you're going to interrupt me, I know, so I'll try to talk louder so I can chant. What's alarming to me is, you're going to sit and judge my level of repentance unto, as Brother Tony said, Maybe, maybe, actually you are saying, if I have not repented of my adultery because of my practice, that's the proof there, then I'm not saved. You have no problem saying that. That's alarming to me that you are going to sit and judge in that manner a man you don't know. I'm, I'm making... And that Tony knows quite, Tony knows quite well... Of, ...of dangerous practices and dangerous doctrines. Friends, the right means, brother, we just put one of these. Should we turn the tables and do that with your life? If I'm meeting is alone that with women? I don't have, I don't have, fuck, you're doing plenty of things that I have to disagree with. I'm it, sure. This is not a mild disagreement. One would be, one would, one would be, what's that? Mike, you do that with your life. You do that does. And you justify it with your life. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Jesus, well, no, you're not you're not you're not you're not you don't know that. You're to let that go. Okay, you no, hold on. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. So, so Pastor Mike is saying, uh, I'm guessing you're saying, when you say that's a lie, Pastor Mike, you're saying that you, you know of other pastors that, that practice that methodology. Of course. That systematically okay. meet with the women of the church and women no, to uh, uh, the church. No, 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 no. Let, let me speak to something else, right? Let me speak right inside of that. Because one of the things that I explained to Pastor Chuck, which does, I don't know if it matters or doesn't matter, but maybe, Bobby, for your benefit, and maybe you know this and maybe you don't, when I first became a pastor, I had lots of concerns about how to do ministry. And one of the things that I did was try to reach out to pastors that I respected at least based on what I knew. And I, before I started meeting with women alone, I called Grace Community Church and talked to Phil Johnson before I knew who Phil Johnson was. I called the Bethlehem Baptist and going to know who I talked to, a pastor of the day. Spent 45 minutes to an hour with each of them discussing this topic. Neither one of them forbade it. They both gave great caution, which I acknowledge and accept and practice. But neither one of them forbade it. Did you tell them that you have three and a half years of adultery in your background and that you are in particular talking about a shepherding ministry in which you're going to meet systematically with the women of the church regularly alone for private counsel, but not just counsel at a particular juncture of crisis in their life, but also just meeting with them for instruction. By the way, no, certainly didn't tell them that because didn't have didn't have that practice in place. And did they know when you're asking them about meeting so, so, alone? Did they know uh, about your so, history? Apparently, apparently, pre-salvation. Pre-Christ and post-Christ is meaningless to you. No, apparently true. you're not a new creation. No, apparently that is true. No, it, it's very much not true. That man, but, but my, no, no, that, man, that man is dead. Based on scripture, my scriptures teach me that man is dead. And, and yet, Mike, um, you, you cannot condone a man with pedophilia in his background having a shepherding meeting ministry where he needs to learn what you just see, did. But you say, but you but see, you say these things just to try to drill down on something you're trying to prove. I don't know that situation. You said it. I don't know if the guy's a pastor. I don't know. Did he a pastor? And he has a congregation, and it's an elder red church, and he has men in his life that know him? 
and, and, and the fathers of those children request and the desire that they meet together? Then yes. Yeah. There's a lot of ifs and buts in your, in your, in your hypothetical. See, what's also not been mentioned, something I tried to explain to you that doesn't seem to matter, you basically say the men of our church are brain dead drones. Probably not even Christians themselves. Like I told you, the one, Charlie Bolton, the one teenage girl that I meet with, was that request of her father. But her father but, requested that. But Mike, you have instructed no but, them no a good shepherding practice. You are the pastor that told them this is good stuff. Instead of counseling them from Scripture, which would tell them what? It would tell them that the husband and father should be the chief under shepherds that should be answering their questions and instructing them in their life. So if any of your any of your any of your psychologists But you have systematically broken down that relationship. You need you need you need with the women alone every week for a pastor Bible study. That's true. You do the women alone. You don't have a no, woman. Every we sure do. We sure do have women's Bible studies. But you said alone. That's not true. Well, Open okay. 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 Pastor led women's Bible study. I, by alone, I mean What's that? And that's wrong now. What's wrong with that? And that's uh, wrong now. The, what's wrong with that is that, that Mike has yeah. a systematic pattern of circumventing God's design. For, for not true. You don't know. No, it is true. That's not true. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, I mean, no, there's another, there's another, of, there's another of, there's another of your lives that you tell. That, that false that that pastor, that he doesn't trust the women to speak. Oh, oh, I explain right, that to you. That's another lie that you tell. That's another lie that you tell. That's another lie that you tell. I explain to you okay. that so no one, one man because, or woman, is pressed to speak. Okay. It, no one is okay, forced to speak. Encouraged. People raise their hands and they're called upon. Right. They're encouraged yeah, to be called upon. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I, don't, I don't... So what if people in the church are encouraged to ask a question? No, that, not that, that's not it. That, that, that's not it. Um, what, what Mike does in private is, is to defy Scripture, the warning to make no provision for the flesh, to flee from oh. sexuality, and to meet with the women. What Mike does in public is to meet with the women on a weekly basis together for a women's Bible study and at a, at a separate meeting to encourage the women, and yes, the men too, to encourage the women to, to speak out publicly in a, in a public gathering of the church, to, to pontificate, to give their theological opinion, and to ask questions directly to the pastors. That is in direct defiance of Scripture. And what yeah, now, once what again, you say, left, you say, you say, let them make fun. And then they You use words like pontificating. They're told to pontificate. You use words like pressing women. Those are lies. No one's pressed. When you have a man that you say you trust that has been to our church, has witnessed our gathering, and telling you that no one is pressed. But you don't believe him. You say press. You say what they're told to pontificate. Those are not true statements. If, if a pastor is encouraging his people, you might also say he's pressing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll drop press. You encourage it. I already did drop it. I said... Hey, hey, hold on a second. I, I want to I say something to address that. So I'm not really necessarily... Part, I think part of the issue, and this is one of the things you've talked about, Pastor Cook, is sometimes when you use this language like pontificate, like press, like... You know, one thing you say, like, they're, they're forcing the women to meet alone. I, I never said Dangerous. No, yeah. it is dangerous. I didn't, didn't say forcing. The women do pontificate. I've been on the website. 
Um, so I retract press and I replace encourage. But when a pastor encourages, it is pressing. That's, that's, we have a thorn. And so, me and Would you say, would you say that when you're here listening, how many of the women don't speak really ever in our church? I, I don't know, man. Remember. I There's don't know. probably, I actually, quite a few. I, I don't know, five. Let's say five that rarely have ever take the microphone. And never are they made to take the microphone or even told they ought to take the microphone. But you you say these things and you use these inflammatory terms that are slanderous. Whether you want to understand that or not, the men that are listening to you are trying to get you to stop using that language. Uh, the, the one word, the one word I, I will, uh, agree might not be accurate as far as how people might understand it. How I understand it, yes, it is pressing because I understand that a pastor has authority and so when a pastor encourages people to speak, it, it is, it is pressing upon them. Um, uh, but if, if you want to use encourage, fine, that's fine. Um, how do you go? Based on how you just defined it, I can't even use encourage. When, when based on what you just defined it, they're allowed to. Okay. They're they're welcome to. I'll use that. I mean, en encourage and press are not the same thing. Not even close. Not, and, and, and I'm not gonna no. With, I, I'm sorry. And that's fine. That's what I'm just telling you how I was was thinking about the term. Uh, when a pastor encourages from the pulpit, there's authority there, and so uh, people do feel pressed to to respond, to to speak up, to interact. Yep, and if I, yeah, yeah, yeah. so again, we're in disagreement on pressing versus encouraging versus the the whether or not that's an okay thing to do. You don't think it is? I'm well aware of that. We believe that that's fine while we have those discussions and Brother Tony, who's been here, wants to be fine with that. And I realize that's not good enough for you. All right. Uh, now, I just want to say something. I, I want to say something in regards to this. So, basically, what we're talking about is we're talking about the context of your Sunday night sort of ask the pastor and elder questions. Is that, is that correct? Well, no, well, I think Chuck's talking about that. I think he's talking about what he's mentioned twice now. We have a Wednesday noon Bible study where the women of our church, the children come with them. The women, the children of our church come. Elder Nick actually leads Wednesdays. I sit with him, but he leads it. Uh, and that happens every Wednesday. He's speaking to that as well. Okay. In well, in, in, regard, in, in regards to the time... First, you think First Corinthians 14... We violate that when, those, when we lead a women's Bible study without their help. Even though we have the exact same Bible study with men on Saturday before the Wednesday, so their husbands can be prepared for what they come home with and be able to lead them through them. But he hasn't heard that because he hasn't asked. What I'm saying, Mike, is, is you do... Well, hold on. So now, now that you have that information that he just said, Pastor Trump, I mean, I think that that kind of... That sheds some light on, you know, I think your concern in regards to that specific thing there. I mean, um, no, I think that's uh, Mike still holds the singular distinction of being the only pastor I know of with significant adultery in his past, who, who also holds the singular distinction of being the only pastor I know of that meets alone as, as part of his shepherding methodology with the women of the church who, who also holds the distinction of, of being the only pastor I know of with a weekly Bible study with, with the women of the church um, who also uh, has, has a unique weekly meeting where the, where the women are encouraged, yes, to pontificate, meaning, meaning speak the theological mind and opinion and understanding and ask questions directly to the pastor, which is in direct violation of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. You may not want to obey it. You may not want to receive it, but that is what it says. Um, uh, and, and so when you're defying scriptures that are clearly are, are given to protect us from, from the possibility of falling 
in sexual immorality by claiming that you you can't fall because your boast is Christ in First Corinthians six nine to eleven guarantees you and, and well David even said, um, it, which is again another singular distinction that Pastor Mike holds. That that is a pattern of of dangerous practice, dangerous it's not a singular distinction. and and aberrant practice with with the women of the church. Um, unheard of. Yes, Okay, in order for it to be I, uh, you would have to show that what he is doing is actually sinful. Hold on. Hold on. All right, so I think one, this is something that bothered me in the past, so I had to look it up. I, there's one, there's two different words in play here. Okay, aberrant is departing from an accepted standard. Yeah. You know, ab- abhorrent is something different. This is something repugnant and disgusting. Yeah. And so I want to make sure we're clear, Pastor Chuck, you, you're saying this is a departure from accepted practice. Yeah. Or normal practice, standard practice. Yeah. Would you, Pastor Chuck, would you agree then, based on that definition, that your street evangelism is aberrant? No. Because it's, it's commanded, it's not that on, on the pages of Scripture. No, that's not my question. That's not my question. That's not my question. You're comparing it to, you, you brought in not the Scriptures, you brought in other churches into the discussion of Facebook Tabernacle. You brought that in. So my question is then, is your, is your street evangelism aberrant when you look at it compared to other churches? Most other churches. That, that's how you're choosing to see me using it. It's not how I'm using it. I'm just asking your question. I'm asking you a simple question. I just answered. That's not how I'm using it. It's not? Well, we're not using it as a, as a, as a, a way from the norm. So, probably he's not using that definition. No. <laughs> well, what, what definition are you using? Uh, well, a deviant from the, the norm of, of church history and, and scripture, not, not um, uh, as, as we're apt to call it, a modern evangelical church. Um, well, hold on now, because, because what you said, Pastor Trent, was the, the issue you were taking up with it is you don't know of any other pastor that does it that way. So if any is a barren, okay, that, okay, fine. That, that fine. It's it's aberrant. Part it's of aberrant. It's aberrant. Um, I don't know of a single pastor that does it that way. I don't. I don't see it anywhere in church history. I don't see it anywhere in the Word of God. It's it's aberrant. Yes, it is. Um, Pastor Chuck, I would encourage you to look back. Uh, well, Brother Tony's got a book. I think he might have it in his finger disc, but that's how he is. But uh, that talks about the pastoring in the in the earlier church back 200, 300 years ago, and the regular practice that pastors made of meeting with women. Hello. You say Andrew. You know. Hello. 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 Yes. They met with women alone. Yeah, alone. See, and, and now you're we can start with Bob uh, Spencer, one of the most respected pastors in uh, late 19th century America, uh, Brooklyn, New York, who went through, in addition to his door-to-door ministry, met with the men and the women individually and alone um, at times. Um, to counsel them, to communicate the gospel with them, to, to, to call them to repent and believe. And, and okay. he I, I don't know the details. it in his book, The Pastor's Sketches. Yeah, I, I don't know the details of it. Um, uh, but it's well, I, I, I'm reading the book. I know the details of it. Is, is that the pattern that we're, <laughs> we're to adopt then? Now, now, hold on a minute. Now let's, let's, now let's stop right here because what's about to happen is that's about to be thrown out because he's going to argue things like, well, did he do it weekly and regularly and all the, all the things that bothers us. Uh, the question all the is, time. Chuck, all the time. This, 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 this,
this goes to the question, this goes to our definition of alone, where our last time, one of the things that was extremely alarming for me was when you defined alone and inappropriate, not just alone, but inappropriate, like a discussion between a man and a woman in a room of 40 people when nobody else could hear them speaking. No, no. You defined that as alone and inappropriate. No, I, I said, uh, when you were asking me what alone means, I said alone could be well, this, brother, alone brother, could be this, alone could be this, brother. alone could be this. I got, um, but I in particular, I got, I, what a load is, is you meeting in an office we agree. alone. By the way, we agree with what you just said there, but I need to get this in there because you also said that that definition of alone in a room with 40 people or reading in a number, a room full of people where only, where the only two could hear each other, you described that as inappropriate. I'm thinking that. It of, matters. Matter, I know we're not talking about that. Mike, what did I ask you earlier? I said, do you meet alone over a meal with someone? That's what I was talking about. Okay, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, Chuck. I need, I, I need you to stay with me because you're, I, I, we're in agreement. We're in agreement on most of what you're saying right in this particular moment. So I want to make sure we don't lose that. I understand you're not saying I meet that way and that's what you're concerned about. I understand that. But I want you to understand my concern for your legalism and the binding of the conscience when your definition of alone and inappropriate includes a discussion with a man and a woman in a room full of people where no one else can hear them. You included that in an inappropriate definition of alone. Shouldn't happen. That's what you said to me. Do you stand by that? And Pastor Chuck, if you stand by that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Pastor Chuck, do you stand by that? Uh, I, I really don't care, frankly, Mike. Yeah, that's immaterial. I do care. I do care because it goes... I, I've already told you. I've one. already told you. I've already said that what I was speaking of was meeting at a restaurant. That's what I was talking okay, about. Okay, so, so are, you willing, are you willing to answer a question about your thinking, or do I just have to answer them about my thinking? Um, <laughs> um, it's a bunny trip. It's, not it's a funny. bunny trip. It's not funny. It's a bunny it's trip, not, Mike. Chuck. It yes, it is. Your Mike, Mike, here's the question. Issue. Here's the question. How are you justifying? How are you justifying? Not justifying anything, sir. Not justifying anything, sir. A asking repentant you a pedophile. Oh wow! Oh, okay. <laughs> Look, guys, we're just talking over each other. We're stopping an inch of ground, James. Um, in this. But Tony, uh, Tony. No, you do see that I, I'm going to go take my sister for a uh, um, for a uh, stress test, and uh, but I won't be coming back onto the call. Um, uh, Pastor Chuck, you accused Pastor Mike of being unsafe. And, I, I uh, accuse him of not and, respecting and biblical repentance. Don't put words in my mouth. I, He's not uh, Chuck, you're arrogant. You're arrogant. You're arrogant. You're arrogant. You're arrogant and interrupting Chuck for the lack of repentance from your pride from when you were before you were saved. You don't allow a man to finish his teaching. Repent of your pride and your arrogance. It doesn't allow Tony to even finish his sentence. Be still, my friend. What you're accusing Pastor Micah of being an unsaved, unregenerate, unregenerate, unrepentant man who has never repented of his adulterous affair prior to when he came to faith in Christ. You're accusing him of being unsaved, Chuck. There's no splitting here. here. There, there's no equivocation here. There's no nuance here. You've accused, you accused Pastor Mike of being unsaved. No, I haven't, Tony. I've said that his practice is not in keeping with the devil. People have accused you. Okay, now tell me. People have accused you of being unsafe, Pastor Chuck. And I stood by you. And I'm standing by Pastor Mike. Um, Tony, you shouldn't stand by me if I'm meeting with women alone against the counsel of the church. I'm done. And I have have a bad thing in my past. I'm done. Lord willing, I am moving to Davenport, Iowa to be under the shepherding of Pastor Mike Reed and Pastor Nick Rowland. And, and Pastor Chuck, with the way this yourself. conversation has gone today and the way everything else has gone in this matter, I cannot in good conscience come to Oregon in August. And you, Pastor, need to determine with your elders whether or not you can continue to support my family. 
But you need to repent, Pastor Chuck. No, Tony. Of accusing you need Pastor Mike. of mitigating dangerous practices and being a legalist. A legalist? No, Tony. It's the word of God. I love you. Brother Tony, I love you. Brother Tony, I love you. Not even entertain. Brother Tony, I love you. You will not even entertain the definition of repentance and make application to my sin. You have repeatedly used rabbit trails to avoid dealing with the issues at hand. Has everyone hung up?